I'd like to welcome you to the 51st annual Manzanar Pilgrimage. We hope that you and your family are doing well during these challenging times. My name is Bruce Embry, and I'm the co-chair of the Manzanar Committee. This virtual pilgrimage is a first for us. For one thing, this is the first time in the past 50 years that we have not made it back to Manzanar. We hope our virtual pilgrimage makes you feel connected and engaged as we take a moment to look back and reflect in order to inform how we should move forward. This year's pilgrimage is dedicated to the memory of Hank Umamoto. Hank endured his teenage years in Manzanar. He returned decades later to lead tours as a docent at Manzanar, participate in archeological digs and lead our pilgrimage. Hank is perhaps best known as the author of From Manzanar to Mount Whitney, the life and times of a lost hiker. Hank's attitude towards life and his dedication to our community is an example for us all. Joining us on this video are Alan Nishio. Alan's our keynote speaker. He's best known for his work as a community activist and organizer. Alan served for 10 years as the Southern California co-chair of NCRR, one of the leading organizations fighting for redress and reparations. Alan continues his activism as chair of the Board of Governors of the Little Tokyo Service Center and as a mentor to young people seeking to serve our community. Dr. Russell Young, professor and chair of Asian American Studies, San Francisco State University, is a leader in the AAPI community, and he's been instrumental in the Stop AAPI Hate campaign. Sarah Omura, the winner of the Manzanar Committee's fourth annual student awards program, will be reading her poem, Has Anything Really Changed? She'll be accompanied on the guitar by her father, Glenn Surovich. Bernadette Johnson is the superintendent of the Manzanar National Historic Site. And Jason Muljati. He is the chair of cultural awareness and community service for the Nikkei Student Union at UCLA and is an organizer of Manzanar at Dusk. We also have clips from past Manzanar pilgrimages, including our interfaith ceremony and UCLA, UCLA Kyoto Taiko, who have been performing at the Manzanar pilgrimage for the past 13 years. We hope you find this video informative, interesting, and hopefully inspiring. Thank you. Hello, my name is Alan Nishio, and I wanna thank you for allowing me to share a few thoughts regarding Manzanar and the critical times we are in. Like you, I was disappointed that the pilgrimage had to be canceled, but I commend the Manzanar Committee for moving forward and keeping this important tradition alive. The message of Manzanar and what it represents is more important now than ever before. This virtual pilgrimage 
allows us to gather online to reaffirm our commitment to ensure that the experience and lessons of Manzanar are not lost. We join together not only to remember what happened, but also to commit ourselves to the fact of stopping any future violations of our civil liberties and civil rights. I was born in Manzanar 75 years ago. The forced removal and incarceration of my family for three and a half years in Manzanar was an experience that has changed our lives forever. Before Executive Order 9066 was issued, my father and mother had been married for seven years. They had a three-month-old daughter, owned a grocery store, and had recently moved into their first home. It was a time of hope and optimism. That hope and optimism turned into trauma and uncertainty when we were forced to move to Manzanar. My parents were forced to sell their store for very little and lost their home. We were only allowed to take to camp that which we could carry and the other things that we could not sell were stored in a neighbor's garage. When we came back from camp, we learned that everything in the garage was stolen. After camp, my father became a gardener, one of the few jobs available to Japanese American men with very little education. He hated this job, but kept it in order to provide for our family. He died at the age of 58 from a condition caused by alcoholism which was attained in the camp. I relate this story to you to give you a sense of a human picture of the experiences of 120,000 Japanese Americans who are incarcerated. As importantly, it's also reflective of some of the experiences that are going on today with immigrants who are being held, whose families are separated are being held in detention centers, often in deplorable conditions. I came of age in the 1960s. My first year in college was at Berkeley during the free speech movement. From that experience, I got involved in protests against the war in Vietnam, the movement for civil rights, and many other social act actions. This was the birth of my career of activism that has continued for the past five decades. I am proud of my involvement in a number of activities that have changed the course of history. Redress for Japanese Americans who were incarcerated during World War II, educational rights, community preservation and development, and the expansion of civil rights. These involvements have formed my identity. It's given me an appreciation for the power of grassroots organizing and the ability of individuals working together to create social change. If I were to have asked myself 50 years ago, when I graduated from college, what the world would look like in 2020, my response would have been one of hope and optimism, that we would be a better, more equitable, and just society in which people were placed above profits. At that time, it was easier to imagine that the world somehow could be one in which justice and equality existed for all, where a country would be judged not how well the 1% live, but rather how the poorest 10% are treated. Instead, today we find ourselves facing a dystopian future in which we are being constantly monitored and civil liberties for the poor are non-existent. We repeat the mistakes of our past instead of learning from them. That said, I still believe in the vision that I did 50 years ago, a memory of what a future can look like if we work together. The Manzanar Pilgrimage provides us with an opportunity to reflect and consider what happens when we remain silent when the rights of others are taken away. President Trump has consistently blamed others, especially immigrants and people of color, for all the problems our nation faces. His strategy has consistently been to lie deflect blame, and scapegoat others, and never take personal responsibility for the challenges we face as a nation. Manzanar did not happen overnight. It happened after decades of vilification, 
legal measures, racism, and discrimination against Japanese Americans, much like what Muslims, immigrants, refugees, and many citizens are facing today. In this environment, the lessons of Manzanar are important as ever. We need to affirm our commitment to ensure that others are not scapegoated and treated as Japanese Americans were during World War II. We must commit ourselves to not remain silent in the face of injustice. We are now witnessing a dramatic rise in racism and xenophobia during the COVID-19 crisis. The recent uptick in acts of anti-Asian racism and violence is clear. This follows a predictable pattern as we have a long history of racism confronting us during times of crisis and fear and unknown. In appealing to fear and anxiety, Trump is engaging a predictable pattern of looking for scapegoats in times of crisis. This trend will continue as a key strategy of his re-election campaign is picturing China as the enemy while continuing his attacks on immigrants, Muslims, women, and communities of color. Democracy is fragile. It is not a given. It is sustained by each generation embracing and fighting for democratic principles. It can be lost in one generation and it is being threatened today more than ever before. We are truly at a critical time in U.S. history. 20 years from now, when we look back on 2020, we will see this as a moment that was a key turning point in our nation. The current era we are in will decide the future of our country for years to come. A moment when we decided to reaffirm the principles of democracy and civil rights, or a moment we turned to demagoguery and authoritarianism, we will remember this moment. During Trump's term in office, he has assaulted the rule of law, undermined the Constitution, and normalized authoritarianism. He has empowered white supremacists and other white right-wing extremists, the base of his support. When we look back on this era, what will we find? Will we have changed the direction of our country or will we be, see the continued slide into xenophobia and fascism? As a product of the 60s, I have hope. I join with others and with a positive view toward the future. This hope is based on the fact that I see many more people, especially young people, questioning what is happening in the world and looking for ways to take action. People who are too busy with their lives or their work are now realizing it is up to us to make the world better. With COVID-19, we're all pausing to reflect on what is important and how we can join together to make our voices stronger. We see a global grassroots movement emerging in the fight against global warming and climate change, a movement driven by young people. We see a national movement to get out the vote in key swing states that will make a difference in the outcome of the November election. Within our local community, we see organizations such as Manzanar Committee, Sudu for Solidarity, Vigilant Love, Nikkei Progressives, and many other organizations that are taking up the call for resistance during this important time. If you're, already, if you're not already involved in these organizations, I would ask that you check them out. 2020 is a critical year. When we look back on this period, will we see a thriving democracy that embraces diversity or will we see an authoritarian state controlled by a privileged few? More importantly, how will you view your own role during this time? Will you be seen as a collaborator or someone who sat on the sidelines during this time of decline? Or will you be seen as a resistor, someone who fought for equality, justice, and inclusion? There is no middle ground. We cannot sign silent in the face of injustice. Martin Luther King Jr. said, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. 
We are living during a time when we cannot remain silent. We must make our lives mean something. We can organize our friends, families. We can work to get out the vote to ensure a better election result. And we can create a blueprint for social justice. We have the power and a part of this change is being part of the Manzanar pilgrimage today. I thank you for your time. Get out there and make your voice heard. Never again is now. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dr. Russell Jung from San Francisco State University. And together with the Chinese for Affirmative Action and Asian Pacific Policy and Planning um, Council, we established the Stop AAPI Hate Center. Um, I'd like to thank the Manzanar Committee for inviting us today, and especially on the 51st um, pilgrimage. So I'd like to share what Stop AAPI Hate Center has been receiving in reports of incidents, especially during this time of the coronavirus and the rising surge of anti-Asian racism. As you can see from this chart, um, we've received a flood of responses and most of them are verbal harassment and shunning. But these aren't just mere microaggressions, but a lot of times you could feel the virulent hate directed towards Asian Americans as we're scapegoated and targeted. A lot of these cases are with elderly and with children present. Another large percentage, if you can see on the bottom, include workplace discrimination, barred from establishment, barred from transportation. Those are civil rights violations. So about 10% of our cases are clear civil rights violations where we're not getting access to safe accommodation to goods and services. And the worst cases are the cases of hate crimes where almost 10% of the cases are actual incidents where people try to physically harm us and that includes being coughed and spat upon. Um, it's sort of unique to this pandemic that people are coughing and spitting at Asian Americans. And again, that's a public health threat in this particular period. Japanese Americans are also um, reporting high rates of these incidents as well. And even in our um, Japanese language site, we've gotten over um, two dozen, I think, reports where Japanese Americans have been harassed. Um, and you can see, um, it's not just Chinese, but it's um, anybody who looks East Asian. And so this is a clear case of racial profiling, not just anti-Chinese sentiment. Um, another thing that's particular to this issue is that uh, the face mask, if you're Asian and wearing a face mask, you're profiled as being a disease carrier. Uh, much like how after 9-11, people who looked Muslim with beards or turbans were profiled as possibly terrorists. Now, if you're Asian and wear a face mask, you're more likely to be perceived as being infected. So you get harassed if you wear a face mask, but if you don't wear a face mask, you get harassed for being infected and being negligent. So that's the sort of conditions we're facing now. It's um, this virulent, virulent, widespread hostility that's similar to 9-11, and I don't know if it approximates what happened um, during um, World War II and Japanese Americans. But I think um, we can really see history repeating ourselves. And so here, here you see a picture of Chinese Americans being quarantined um, after the bubonic plague. So I think just quickly, you know, what's happening is that the yellow peril stereotype is being resurrected again, that Asians are seen as a threat and that they're gonna take over and dominate the West, either with their disease or through war. And that's again what happened in World War II. And just like World War II, you're seeing inflammatory political rhetoric to serve the interests of the politicians, and you're seeing um, media images that vilify um, Chinese and Asians. Um, in this case, media is constantly representing the coronavirus as um, or with Chinese people with masks. As a result, people are quickly racially profiling us and uh, attacking us. But the other thing that's repeating, I think, in terms of history is that just like in the past, Asian Americans have always resisted the discrimination and the racism that they faced. Um, and for example, fighting for redress and reparations or fighting the Chinese Exclusion Act. Today, Asian Americans are standing up to the anti-Asian hostility that they're experiencing. Um, just like we fought on the political level, 
our Asian American elected leaders are standing up against and denouncing the anti-Asian rhetoric. And on the media level, we're developing hashtag movements and our celebrities and our athletes are standing up um, to combat the racism. <clears throat> and in the past, um, just like in redress and reparations and just like the Manzanar um, Pilgrimage Committee, we're coming together as an organized group to develop collective voices, to remember the past and to, um, to pledge to not repeat the past. So through our Stop AAPI Hate Center, we're developing individual reports, but we're gathering them to develop a collective voice. And through that, we're finding out, well, what resources do we need to build resili resilience? What kind of strategic policy interventions do we need? Um, for example, in the schools or at the workplace. And right now, we're calling for Governor Newsom um, to organize a statewide strike team to address these cases of anti-Asian hate. So. Um, that's what's happening on our level. I'd like to congratulate you again for your pilgrimage and hope that you'll support and stand in solidarity um, in our efforts um, to fight anti-Asian hate and to um, continue the legacy of our ancestors. Thank you. Poverty, starvation, children in jail. Many protests, but little prevail. How can we fix this world, oh so cruel? Well, surely not us, we're still in school. Oh, true soul, let those lessons you have read in a book lead your way to seize social injustice, something everyone else overlooks. Regard our government state in the decades past. Recently slashed down a wall that couldn't last. Our mistakes have affected us greatly whether in the past or present. Racism in its truest form. Witness humanity's descent. First the racetrack, then camp. Their dignity now with a dent. Sun in their eyes, dust in lungs. 120,000 behind bars, without trial or consent. Come across and get caught. Now there is separation, deportation.
dreams of a better life turn to nightmares and humiliation. With our new president, history must not repeat. He should not separate communities through a single tweet. Yet, to fully understand is hard. People have no former information. If we all do our part, they will understand what has happened to our nation. We must stand strong with each other. Educate all so they know. We are stronger together. All friends, not foe. Last year on our 50th annual Mounds in Our Pilgrimage, we said, today's pilgrimage takes place in the midst of dangerous times. Unfortunately, this is still the case. Today, we see the all too familiar expression of race prejudice, failure of political leadership, and the rise of xenophobia in the face of the COVID-19 crisis. We are witnessing a dramatic upswing in anti-Asian violence. We see extremely repressive and brutal attacks on immigrants and refugees seeking safety and a better life. We see calls to suspend our constitutional rights by the highest legal officers in our land, threats to suspend Congress and autocratic musings about total control from the executive branch, all while blaming China for the pandemic. Demonizing people has a long history in our country and has always led to the denial of civil and constitutional rights and to economic exploitation of different peoples. This administration's effort to put an Asian face on the virus is no accident. Labeling COVID-19 the quote foreign virus unquote or the quote Chinese virus unquote has resulted in harassment and violent attacks across the country. The crisis of the COVID-19 pandemic has fueled this administration's trademark nativist and xenophobic policies. The Trump administration is fueling the violence against the AAPI community. While much of the racism and violence is playing out in public view, some of the most brutal aspects are taking place in America's present day concentration camps. This pandemic is threatening the lives of thousands of immigrants and refugees detained by ICE. These detention centers, or really these concentration camps, are a breeding ground for disease, especially something as deadly as the COVID-19 virus, and is a human tragedy unfolding before our eyes. This is why the Manzanar Committee has joined with Sudo for Solidarity and the Detention Watch Network in calling for the release of all those in ICE custody. It also appears that history is repeating itself in the way some in the AAPI community have chosen to respond to the rise in anti-Asian racism. Resurrecting the long discredited model minority view, Andrew Yang and others calling us in his words to quote, embrace and show our Americanness in ways we never have before. We should show without a shadow of a doubt that we are Americans who will do our part for our country in this time of need, unquote. Many in our community argued before and after camp exactly what Yang is saying today. Just be good Americans, don't make waves or protests, show how patriotic we are and everything will be fine. Well, giving a pass to those profiting from hate actually stifles our ability to stop these attacks. We must not fall back on old ineffective strategies that kept our community marginalized for far too long. For 51 years, the Manzanar Committee has returned to Manzanar to honor our families and build community. We chose to remember how in a time of crisis, our government failed us. We also remember how despite the social and economic trauma our community experienced, we did speak up. We organized as a community and we won redress. 
We remember how using the same Bill of Rights that failed to protect us and our community in 1942, we came together and demanded our government redress the wrongs of Executive Order 9066. This year, while we can't walk where our families lived while being deprived of their rights and living behind barbed wire, we must continue to tell our story, to remember how our families endured the trauma at camp. We should remember that our community came together to demand justice and today stands with other communities as they face persecution simply because they seek refuge and a better life for their families. Today, we must raise our voices louder than ever to remind our country that democratic and civil rights for all people must always be what this country is about. Thank you very much.
Hello. On behalf of the National Park Service and the staff at Manzanar, I want to tell you how sorry we are that we cannot be together for a pilgrimage this year. Normally, we stand at the base of Mount Williamson and welcome you back to this special place where we remember the wartime experiences of over 11,000 people. A place that brings a sense of healing, but also renewal for us to continue to tell these important stories. But today is different. For all of us that work at Mandanar, we didn't get up this morning and put on our green and gray to greet you. I'm not wearing my ranger hat. So rangering is very different in the midst of this pandemic. We are joining you virtually, anxiously waiting until we can see you all again in person. And when we can safely reopen the visitor center and welcome people back to hear about wartime experiences. Most of our staff is working remotely, working on things like new interpretive media and archeology span projects, even tackling our backlog of oral history interviews and our museum collection. But there are a few staff members who are still working on site, making sure that the buildings are safe and taking care of the historic orchard during this critical time. I wanna share a few special projects that we participated in and awards that we received. The first one is the California Governor's Award for Historic Preservation. This award was presented to Mantanar for our very popular volunteer program public archaeology. The public archaeology program is only made possible because of the hundreds of volunteers that include individuals, that are, some are former incarcerees and school groups. Um, our focus recently has been on the Children's Village, Manzanar's Orphanage, in fact, the only orphanage of all 10 camps. And this past summer, we even had one of the children that lived at the orphanage help in one of the weekends. Some of the volunteers that have helped us for decades are no longer with us. And even though we can't name everybody who passed away this year, this particular group um, was important and we dedicated this award to them. These three gentlemen volunteered with us for decades and made so many things possible. Those individuals are Hank Umamoto, who was a teenager when his family arrived in camp, Dick Lord and Art Williams. We will forever be grateful to these men and are appreciative of the work that they helped us accomplish. The second project that we worked on and are especially proud of is the Qatari program. Qatari was um, a highlight for many of, on our staff, uh, bringing together college students, former incarcerees and Manzanar park rangers for a very rich weekend, bringing them to this landscape and bringing to life the experiences endured by former incarcerees. It allowed us to build relationships with these college students and we watched them begin their transformation to becoming caretakers of these important stories and experiences. As a result of the program, one of our own colleagues was recognized by the National Park Service Ranger Rose Masters was a co-recipient of this year's Freeman Tilden Award. It is the highest award 
in the National Park Service for interpretation. But what can sum it up best is one of this year's own participants. Jason Muljadi, in part, wrote this. Katari wasn't the life-changing experience that I had expected it to be. It was more than that. It was more like a rally. It was a reminder of the injustices that exist in the world that have been long brewing in the foundations of our society. Injustices which many minorities are still facing. It was an opportunity to listen and to stand by what men said, take action, keep the stories of the Japanese Americans alive so that Manzanar won't happen today. My colleagues at Manzanar and I are forever grateful for the relationships we have with many of you, uh, former incarcerees, their families, volunteers, and visitors. We look forward to seeing you in person and hope that you are well and are staying healthy. Thank you. I always knew that I was a different child. Even as I've entered high school, I was treated differently, never belonging comfortably in the spheres that dominated social life. In college, I saw people who looked more like me sharing the same cultural values as me. I've learned this concept, cultural identity, from Nikkei Student Union and the Manzanar Pilgrimage. Originally, I joined NSU because I played Taiko, but I began to learn more about the Japanese American community, replacing old information with new ones. Then I went to the pilgrimage where I was overwhelmed. How could something like this happen to Americans? In my first year, I experienced discussions that settled a foundational belief in me that this is an injustice that should never again happen to anyone. In my third year, I pledged to understand more about the discrimination against Japanese Americans and other Asian Americans. I engaged in these discussions regarding stopping travesties. I did my best to help this Japanese American community that I love and to educate people on these incarceration camps. Yet, one thing have always seemed to have bothered me. How can this Chinese Indonesian American from Jakarta, Indonesia relate to Manzanar and the other Japanese American incarceration camps? Often, I visualize these realities as an ocean apart, waves beckoning to drown me in confusion, churning out doubts that say, this is not my fight. Other times, it's a desert apart, enticing me to wander into environments where there's no mirage, no hope. How do you embrace a community with different identities when you've yet to reconcile with your own? I wondered if this is what Ruff Lazo felt when he decided to voluntarily go to Manzanar along with his friends. A Mexican-Irish-American boy from Los Angeles, Ralph could have ignored the atrocities that were happening around him. Instead, he showed what was undoubtedly an act of solidarity for the Japanese-American community at a time where the vitriol towards him was incessant. I'm reminded by my wonderful Auntie Cherry Uyeda, one of the many incarcerated at Manzanar and my lifelong mentor, that people such as Ralph existed, people that stated that internment was wrong and that Japanese-Americans are no less Americans than they are. With my previous Manzanar experiences, I see more than just the Japanese American community. I see an empathy from people of all colors and cultures, all expressing how this forceful event of incarceration is a human rights violation. Different points of views were shared. Manzanar became a place of dialogue, transformed from being a place of captivity. But although Manzanar is a historical site today, it would be wrong to say it is history. The zeitgeist of the 40s and 50s are alive today with the discrimination against Muslim Americans and their travel bans, the African Americans and the blatant racism and societal inequities, the Latinx communities and the multitude of social inequalities, the Cambodian Americans and the fear of deportation and the lack of education, and many more communities in America who continue to face racial discrimination, educational inequality, wealth disparity, and other socio-political disparities, especially during this time of uncertainty and despair brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic. We have to do our part to ensure that these injustices never happen again. I know that this seems like an insurmountable obstacle, and one often parroted without any success. For where do we go when we feel like we're drowning in this sea of sadness, sinking into an abyss of uncertainty? 
Saint Therese of Lisieux taught me that small actions with big love go a long way. Dialogue is difficult, but understanding one another helps. Checking in with people during this tumultuous time and listening intently is a step in the right direction. Of course, every step forward may sometimes be a step back, but one does not need to be in a position of power to do something. We all can do things out of love, and we all have the power to start waking waves of change. It would be altruistic for me to say that this is the right way, but I know that there are many outlets that reflect the spirit of Manzanar. For me, Manzanar was what helped me to embrace my identity as a Southeast Asian and a Chinese Indonesian American. Because of what I learned, I was able to, along with three other amazing individuals, create a space for Indonesian Americans in my college community where we share our various experience and, share, and stand up in solidarity with our fellow Asian Americans and other Americans as we see unfortunate events unfolding daily. It is a small step in what I hope to be a ripple effect that can help my community. Just as I keep Japanese American stories alive, so too alive for my Indonesian Americans. We fight for the rights of others. We fight in memory of the Japanese Americans who never got reparations and for the stories that we should never forget. We fight for all people to be respected and represented as human beings. This is the man's in our way and our human way. Jangan pernah lupa, tidak akan lagi. Never forget, never again.
Thank, thank you, thank you for taking the time to be here. here. Uh, I am Reverend Dr. Dr. Yoshi Tsuyuki, Head Minister of the Kongo Church of Los Angeles. I belong to the Nikkei Interfaith Group with the Buddhist Association of Christians. Uh, today we have a, a representative from Islam and an Imam who will also be participating, uh, Tendikyo, and all the faiths have gathered together today. I will invoke the imperatives of all the little portions of my ceremony and it will be clarified. It will be done in English, okay? So with that, let us begin. Processional and greetings at the Sacred Center. Day. Solemn greetings. Please join me in offering four solemn audible claps in sincere unison. Shahakshu. Right of purification. Onusa Gyoji. pain and suffering, and all negativities now be dispelled to the great and vast universe of the principal parent. Allow each and every one of us to be in the purest state of mind. Thus, be blessed and purified. Oh, 
it, it was race prejudice, war hysteria, and failure of political leadership. Oh Lord God, we remember the forced evacuation, lifetime investments in properties, farm and land, and businesses lost in the shovel. Oh Lord God, money in Japanese bank accounts confiscated, high school graduation interrupted, university diplomas delayed for some 60 years. Ideals of democracy, the U.S. Constitution, and citizen rights betrayed. Not because we were Japanese, not because we were Buddhists, not because we were Shintoists or Confucianists. We were docile because we were immigrants. The bottom line for all immigrants is the same in all countries throughout history. Absorb all the insults and humiliation. Absorb the military drafting of our sons right out of the concentration camps. The bottom line for all immigrants is suck it up or go home. But, but immigrants are not vulnerable forever. The second and third generation fight back. We honor the 